Good morning. Welcome to Victoria's Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. Last, the last two weeks, we have studied the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then this week, for the last two days, we have been studying the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we were first talking about that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is for us today. It is not passed away. It did not belong to a previous generation or a previous dispensation. It is for us. And it's not only for some people, it's for all Christians. Now I say it is for some people because it's only for those who are born again. If you're born again, if you're a Christian, it's for you. It is for all Christians. And then yesterday, we also began explaining what is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we started by looking at the definition of the word baptism. What does the word baptism mean? Well, in the Greek, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means to dip, to submerge, to cover completely Cover completely, cover completely, all right, you got it, by immersion in something that envelops on all sides. And we talked about that's why baby dedications and baptisms that sprinkle are not true baptisms because sprinkling is not a baptism. It is not a submersion and it's not a complete coverage. And if we were to talk about water baptism at another time, it is also by choice and by faith. And so anyway, what is that? And I don't want to give disrespect to that practice. What is that? Let's apply it to what is valuable to us today. That sprinkling of babies. It is actually a dedication. It is not salvation. Because that child that is sprinkled will need to grow up and make their own choice. And choose for themselves to make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. And exercise their own faith. Believe for themselves. It is by personal choice and by personal faith, personal choice and personal faith. So it is the sprinkling does not bring salvation. It is not even an accurate baptism because as we see the word baptism means to submerge and cover completely. But what is it? What is it valuable for? I don't want to be disrespectful or discredit at all. I don't want anyone to take offense at what I have said about the sprinkling of babies. What can it be useful for? It is dedication of a child. And that does not bring salvation. But even in evangelical churches, Protestant churches, Pentecostal churches, we do practice baby dedications. After a baby is born, a parent can bring their baby into the church and the pastor lays hands on the baby. And what is that? We call it dedication. It is saying, Lord, I offer to you my child and I ask you to work in their life, his or her life. Watch over him all the days of his life. Draw him to yourself Help him to be born again. And baby dedication is also parental commitment to responsibility to teach and train that child in the knowledge of the ways of God. So baby dedication is saying, Lord, I dedicate my child to you. I ask you to keep your hand on my child all the days of their life, but it's equally a parental dedication. It's not only a baby dedication, it's parental dedication. The parent is dedicating themselves. The parents are dedicating themselves to say, I make a commitment today to teach and train my child in the ways of God. And so I will do my part 
and God, you do your part. That's what baby dedication is. And that is the value of even the sprinkling of babies. And that is a very valuable thing. So we're not discrediting that and we're not dishonoring that. It is a very valuable thing if we understand what it actually accomplishes. It does not accomplish salvation, but it does accomplish a dedication where you are committing them to God. You're committing yourself to that child and you're saying you're doing, you're going to do your part and God then I ask you to do your part in my child's life. So it's a very valuable thing. And so um, back to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we saw yesterday, what is the baptism in the Holy Spirit? It is a second experience in the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, after or subsequent to the new birth. And so what happens in the new birth? The new birth is when the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. Jesus said in John fourteen seventeen that for he, the spirit of truth lives with you. He will be in you talking to them about when they would be born again after his resurrection. And then again, in John four fourteen. Jesus said, whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him, in him, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And then it says, by this, he was speaking of the Holy Spirit, which they would later receive. So the Holy Spirit brings the new birth, salvation, eternal life inside of you. And the Holy Spirit does come in you to comfort you, to encourage you to guide you, to teach you, to minister to you, to help. And that's why some people say, well, I have received the Holy Spirit. Yes, you have. But there is more. There is more help available. And that is in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And in the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So by definition, the Holy Spirit, you are submerged in the Holy Spirit. I gave the example yesterday of the glass and you take water, a pitcher of water, and you start pouring in the glass. And as you can imagine this, you're pouring and pouring and pouring in the glass until it's filled and you keep pouring and you don't stop pouring. You just keep pouring, 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 pouring. After the glass is filled, it starts running over. And then there is water that is welling up and then also running over the glass, covering it completely on all sides. It envelops the water, envelops the glass. That is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. First, the Holy Spirit comes in you to live inside of you. And if you're born again, it says in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit bears witness in your spirit that you are a child of God. You have that witness of the spirit. And that's why you, you know, some of those who argue against the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they say, well, I already have the Holy Spirit. I know I've got him. Yes, you do. Yes, you know, you've got him because he bears witness with you that you are a child of God, that you're born again. But there's more. There's more that you can receive. And that is when he keeps filling, 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 filling until he's running over and covering you completely on all sides. Now, let me give you two examples, which are proofs in the New Testament that there are two different experiences. Now, they can come quickly, one right after the other, new birth first, and then right afterward coming the baptism in the Holy Spirit baptism in the Holy Spirit. They can come quickly one after the other, but they are definitely two different experiences. And let me show you two proofs and examples in the New Testament where it is very clear that there were two different experiences. First of all, and we talked about this last week when we talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at John Chapter 20, John chapter 20, in verse one, it says early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb 
and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So what happened there? That was early. When was that? That was the first day of the week. That was Sunday. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. And she saw that the tomb was empty. Jesus had been raised from the dead. This was resurrection day. Now in verse 19, it says on the evening of that first day of the week. What day was it? The first day. That was the same day. Now, remember earlier up in the passage, Jesus saw Mary and talked to Mary and he said, do not touch me because I have not yet returned to the father. But go and tell my disciples that I am going to my father and your father to my God and your God. He said, don't touch me. I've not yet returned to the father. So that was in the morning. And then she went and told the disciples and it was the same day later in the day on the evening of that same day, the first day of the week, verse 19, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Well, he had to say that first because they were frightened. They were scared spitless, you could say. So they were frightened and he said, peace be with you. And verse 20 says, after he said this, he showed them his hands inside. Why? He was proving who he was. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, again, Jesus said, peace be with you as the father has sent me. I'm sending you verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So notice in verse 22, Jesus said, it says, with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we talked about this last week. This was the new birth. The word spirit in the Hebrew and in the Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament word for spirit is the same word for breath. It's the word ruach. It's the same word for spirit and breath. Breath and spirit. Same word. This also in the Greek. It's the word pneuma in Greek in the word spirit is the same word as the word breath. So Jesus breathed on them. It's the same as what God did to Adam in Genesis 2, 7. Genesis 2, 7 says God formed the man from the dust of the earth and he breathed in him the breath of life, and the man became a living being, a living spirit. Now, the word breath is the same word for as spirit, so you could equally translate that he breathed in him the breath of life. You could say he spirited into him the spirit of life, and the man became a living being. Now that's what God did to Adam. And here in John 20, 22, Jesus did the exact same thing to the disciples because they had been dead spiritually. Spiritual death is separation from God. That spirit of life is cut off. So they were spiritually dead and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit came and dwelt in them, worked the new birth, worked the new creation in them with a new spirit, new breath of the spirit of God in them. So they were born again. They were born again the same day that Jesus was raised from the dead. They're born again from this point forward. All the disciples that were there, 
There were 11, because there were 12 minus Judas Iscariot. And who knows how many women were with them. And if there were any other disciples there as well. It just said that the disciples were together. So we know there were at least 11 of them, plus women and maybe other disciples. From that moment, they are saved. Born again, they have received the born again experience. And then after they were born again, it says that Jesus stayed with them for 40 days. In Acts chapter 1, Acts 1 verse 3, it says, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. We talked about the kingdom of God last year. And verse 4 He's talking to the disciples who are born again, who are already saved. He said in verse four, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about for John baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's the first place where we see baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so we see that he was giving them a great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But he said, but wait, but wait, don't go yet. Hold it. Hold your horses. Wait in Jerusalem for the gift my father has promised you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You will be dipped, submerged and covered completely with the Holy Spirit. And what's going to happen? Verse eight says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you could add the word. Then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So. You see that the disciples received the new birth in John 20 and Jesus told, and that was immediately the same day as the resurrection day. That was resurrection day. And then afterward, Jesus told that same group of disciples to wait for a second experience called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And he said it was so important that they should not even leave Jerusalem and preach around the world until they first receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's saying, don't leave home without it. Hallelujah. And then, you know, in Acts chapter two, on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together together. In one place, and suddenly the sound of a blow, the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Verse four, all of them were filled and you could say overflowing. That's the baptism with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the spirit enabled them. Who is this in Acts two? It's the same disciples that were in that room in John 20. So we see the same people, same disciples, two different experiences, two different days. And if you know, the day of Pentecost was also the Feast of Weeks. That was, and that's why Penta cost, Penta means 50. It was 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. So they were born again on resurrection day, 50 days later, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, same disciples, two experiences. Also, there was, again, another proof that there are two separate, distinct experiences, new birth, and then following subsequently with baptism in the Spirit. In Samaria, the believers in Samaria, in Acts chapter 8, in Acts chapter eight, verse five, it says, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed 
the Christ there. Verse 6, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. Verse 12. Skip down to verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God, so they believed, that was faith, and the name of Jesus Christ, so they believed the name, they were baptized, both men and women, and that was obviously water baptism. And as Peter said later, if you are, um, you are, you believe you receive and then you get baptized, the baptism is a confirmation of the salvation, water baptism. So they believed and were baptized. What is that experience? That was new birth under the ministry of Philip. So under Philip's ministry, they received new birth. Then skip to verse 14. Verse 14 through 17, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Verse 15, when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, that's not the new birth because they were born again under Philip's ministry. But verse 16 says, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come, there's the word, upon, not in, but upon them. That's the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Now that is salvation. Salvation is baptism into the name of Jesus or baptism into Jesus. And so then, verse 17, Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit, or you could say the gift of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now you cannot lay your hands on somebody and they get saved. No, salvation is where they receive and believe and confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a ministry that can be imparted by the laying on of hands. So you see, there were two different, very distinctly separate experiences that these people in Samaria had. First, under the ministry of Philip, they believed and were saved. Later, under the ministry of Peter and John, they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Two separate, distinct different experiences at different times under the ministry of different people. First Philip and then Peter and John. So the point that we're getting to, and I'm going slow, but I'm laying out groundwork. I'm laying like a legal court case for you that shows in scripture, in scripture, Two different experiences because there are so many Christians who have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they're saying, but I've already got the Holy Spirit. They don't understand that there is, there are two experiences. There is a different experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit that comes after salvation. And we see it very clearly by two, these two examples, and we can show you more later, but these are very Two, two very clear examples and proofs of people who had two different experiences in the Holy Spirit. First, salvation. Later, on a later date, baptism in the Spirit was speaking in other tongues. Hallelujah. Well, that's all we have time for today. And I want to remind you again, this Saturday, March 8th, is our next Victorious Faith Seminar. We moved it from Friday to Saturday, and we moved it from 7 to 6.30. We're going to start at 6.30 for the main service. If you want prayer, come early at 6. Now, we will have a laying on of hands in the service after we, because this is going to be a healing service. We are having a healing service this Saturday. So we will teach on healing and then minister and pray for healing for all those who need healing in their bodies. 
sickness, disease, pain, or injury, come and receive healing. However, if you want agreement and prayer for anything else, then you can come at six o'clock and that will be our prayer time from six to six thirty pre-service prayer, six to six thirty. Then the main service will begin at six thirty. And again, it will be at the Comfort Suites in the Denver Tech Center at I-25 in Dry Creek. That's one block east of I-25 and one block north of Dry Creek on South Clinton. The address is 7374 South Clinton Street. If you want more information, go to my website at www.victoriousfaith, V-I-C-T-O-R-I-O-U-S, faith, F-A-I-T-H dot C-O. And um, you can see it on my website or you can email me at info at victoriousfaith dot co hallelujah also you could call 720-244-0535 now come we are going to have a powerful service we will have fellowship together in the word and then afterward fellowship together as well so i want to meet you come out and meet me i want to meet you face to face and so god bless you join me again tomorrow and remember god loves you you are blessed and highly favored by the lord